Alright everybody, it's time to start solving mysteries, so let's get right into it. Alan Scott, The Green Lantern number 3 is written by Tim Sheridan, with art by Kian Tormi, colors by Matt Hermes and Chris Sotomayor, and letters by Lucas Gattoni. The title of this issue is A Spectre Calls. Alan Scott's investigation into the killer terrorizing New York isn't going very well, and the bodies are piling up. But as they do, a pattern starts to emerge. So far, all of the victims have been gay men with connections to Alan Scott. But despite that, what troubles Alan the most is the general disinterest the police seem to have in investigating these murders themselves. He assumes the worst, thinking that the police might prefer it if a few more criminal deviants were taken off the street once and for all. But Jay Garrick isn't convinced. The Justice Society is also investigating this case, which Alan would have known if he'd actually been going to the meetings. Flash doesn't understand why Green Lantern is taking all of this so personally. Although, as the conversation goes on, I think Jay starts to get it. Alan is still very much committed to the idea of pushing everyone away so that they won't get hurt, so I don't know what bothers him more. The fact that the police aren't investigating these murders, or the fact that the JSA are. The JSA member assigned to this case is Jim Corrigan, the Spectre, a cop who died and came back as a ghostly spirit of vengeance. He's spent hours chasing down leads and interrogating informants in truly creepy supernatural ways. If you didn't know Corrigan was one of the good guys, this would feel like a horror comic for a few pages. Alan shows up just to tell Corrigan to back off, but ends up going along for the ride as Corrigan follows up on the information he's gathered. Green Lantern and the Spectre walk right through a wall, into the records room of a police station. After a little bit of digging, they find a file on the latest victim. Alan is as confused as he is frustrated, because not only is the file empty, it's not even in the right police station. The victim was found in the 10th precinct, but his empty file was hidden away in the 1st precinct. Alan thinks this is confirmation that the police intend to ignore the entire case, but the Spectre disagrees. Remember, Corrigan is a cop, so he knows that the best way to bury a file like this is to just not create one in the first place. The fact that the file exists, and is empty, and is in the wrong police station on the wrong side of the city, means that someone most likely tampered with the evidence and then tried to hide it. Someone who could walk into a police station and handle the files just as easily as the two of them did. The Spectre realizes that someone is trying to frame Alan Scott. The victims are all connected to Alan, and Alan clearly has the ability to enter a police station and handle evidence. Meaning that whoever did this knows all of Alan's secrets, and could either blackmail him or completely ruin all aspects of his life. Now, as I was reading and enjoying this conversation between Green Lantern and the Spectre, I still found it odd that it was the Spectre that was helping Alan work through all of this. After all, Jay has shown up in a few issues at this point, and Green Lantern and the Flash is a classic team-up in any era, so why focus on the Spectre? Well, the answer comes when they move to the roof of the police station. It was bad enough when terrible things would happen to Alan's loved ones seemingly at random, but now there's evidence that someone is actively murdering everyone Alan's ever been close to. He sees this, all of this, as being his fault, and those feelings are amplified by everything he's ever felt living at the mercy of an unsympathetic society that would just as soon cast him out because of who he loves. And this is why you need the Spectre. Because Corrigan is the only person around who's truly in a position to say, with any real authority, that this kind of hate and discrimination are man-made and unnatural. The Spectre is unique in that he can speak on this from outside the confines of our society. Earthly prejudices mean nothing to ghosts and gods, so the Spectre can cut through all of the noise and tell Alan that love isn't a sin. It isn't some evil act deserving of retribution, and most importantly, the deaths of these men aren't Alan's fault. And for good measure, Corgan adds the little detail that Alan wouldn't have been able to love any of these men if God didn't want him to. Now that he's calmed down, Alan starts putting the pieces together. The killer has to be someone who knows that Alan Scott is a gay man with connections to all of the victims. It has to be someone who can enter a police station and tamper with files as easily as Green Lantern could. 
And most importantly, it has to be someone who knows how Johnny Ladd died, burned and drowned at the same time, because that's what happened to all of the victims. Everything that happened out at sea with the Crimson Flame was highly classified, and only a few people on Earth know anything about it. But none of them would have the power to tamper with the records like that. That's when Alan remembers the voice. It's something he's always wished he could forget. The voice of the flame, promising to bring death, then life, then power. It's what revived him after the train crash, and made him the Green Lantern. And it's the same as the voice he heard the night Johnny died. A glorious, horrible realization washes over Alan's mind as he parts ways with the Spectre, and flies off into the night as fast as he can. Alan races home, only to find a shadowy figure standing in his study. Alan reaches out to him, calling his name, Johnny. But the intruder punches Alan to the ground, and we're finally introduced to the Golden Age Red Lantern, standing over Alan Scott, speaking in Russian, which roughly translates to story time, my love. Which honestly sounds great, because it makes me think that next issue is going to answer a lot of questions that we've all had since this started. Now, the same day this issue came out, we also got Justice Society of America number 8, which focused heavily on the character of Ruby Sokov, the daughter of the Golden Age Red Lantern. And while I will be talking extensively about Ruby at a later date, it's important to note that Alan Scott in the present day describes the Golden Age Red Lantern as a notorious and ruthless Soviet spy that gained possession of a violent energy source, the Crimson Flame. So it's possible that Johnny was always a spy, and that he was just using Alan to get closer to the Crimson Flame, but there might be more to it than that. The current run of Justice Society of America has been careful not to reveal anything that would spoil the events of this miniseries, so there's a good chance that whatever's going on with Johnny has another layer to complicate it. Maybe I was right last time, maybe Johnny Ladd died so the Red Lantern can live, and he's literally a different person now than he was when Alan knew him. It certainly wouldn't be the first time this book has commented on the complexity of personal identity. Hell, when the Spectre reveals that he knows Alan's secret identity, Alan starts talking about himself in the third person, as if Alan Scott was someone different from Green Lantern. And that's just scratching the surface in a story that also contains Billy and Billings. So that's it for issue 3. Now I want to hear your thoughts on it. Did you enjoy this portrayal of the Spectre? Are you surprised that Johnny is alive? Why do you think he's framing Alan for all these murders? Tell me all about it in the comment section down below, and remember to subscribe to the channel if you want more Green Lantern content. Until next time, thank you for taking the time to watch. My name is Dan, we'll talk again soon.